Thank you for joining us for the Federal P Regulatory Panel on Dental Interoperability and Data Exchange. We are, are glad that you all joined us today for this exciting panel. We're going to be exploring the evolving federal regulatory landscape related to health information exchange and interoperability. During today's call, our panelists will discuss the importance and opportunities for dental participation in information exchange. Our panelists include Dr. Natalia Chalmers, Chief Dental Officer, Office of the Administrator, Centers for Medicaid and or Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, Attorney Peyton Isaac, who is the Privacy Specialist, uh, Health Information Privacy Data Cybersecurity Division at HHS Office for Civil Rights. Uh, Mr. David Lewis, Senior Policy Advisor, Law Enforcement Division, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice and Dr. Albert T Taylor, Medical Informatics Offer Officer, the Office of Technology, Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. And I am Rebecca Feen, Director of Dental Benefits, Coding, and Data Exchange within the Practice Institute of the American Dental Association, and I'll be the moderator for this session. And if I may, I'd like to make a few opening remarks about the state of dental data exchange. Adoption of health information technology in dental offices has increased and is marked by the widespread use of electronic dental records, practice management systems, and its related software. Findings from a 2023 ADA survey revealed that private practices have achieved a 98% adoption rate of electronic practice management and health records. In that same survey, practice pro private practice providers indicated that the number one consideration for purchasing new software is the seamless integration of software, including their imaging, business insights and analytics, and data from primary care or medicine. Yet a majority of these providers also identified that their practices have ongoing issues with the sharing of clinical, administrative, and imaging data with others. Navigating the evolving landscape of health information technology will take a whole community, and the ADA is honored to, uh, to host our panelists. And with that, I would like to invite our uh, presenters to make a few opening remarks about their respective agencies and how summarize how their agency's work influences and supports the dental industry. And we want to hear how and why health care data exchange, interoperability, and standards are prioritized within their agency's efforts. I'd like to go ahead and start with uh, Mr. David Lewis. Yeah. As Rebecca said, my uh, my name is David Lewis. I'm a senior policy advisor uh, here at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is a sub-agency of the Department of Justice and the Office of Justice Programs. Uh, we have uh, specific responsibilities for um, managing the prescription drug monitoring program here at BJA. And we get uh, we we not only provide funding but also provide um, support through training and technical assistance. Next slide, please. Um, these are our basic focus areas that uh, we we have here. Is that um, not only are we looking at the sharing of information, but also uh, the collection and understanding what impact uh, the opioid epidemic has uh, on in the field. Uh, we also look at, uh, there are uh, 54 um, PDMPs across the, uh, the country and the territories. And we provide, like I said, we provide funding uh, support. But we also have the Prescription Drug Monitoring uh, Training and Technical Assistance Center um, called TTAC, PDMP TTAC. And we ask that uh, if you have any questions or you need anything, um, you can actually go to their website and they have additional information resources and things that we can do to help you. And we'll talk a little bit about things that we have um, based on this particular subject. Next slide, please. So I was asked to come here today to talk about the technology as it relates to um, the, the, the dental industry. Uh, we have a lot of different groups that are in here. I understand that um, you know many um, dental offices are uh, utilizing and going to the PDMP uh, systems going to their states, but they have to do it as uh, logging off their one system and then going on to PDMP outside the system. And I'm going to show you that the, the uh, comparison of the two here uh, on the next slide. 
So if you look at these two diagrams, the one on the left um, is direct user uh, access to the to PDMPs. And as you can see at the very top, uh, the user, they log onto their, their uh, integrated system to the left, and then if they need to get uh, PDMP information, they have to log into the PDMP system separately. So it's two um, methods that they go in there to get information. It's not integrated at all. But if you move to the right, you'll see what an integrated system actually looks like. So you have um, the user, actually, that they log into their integrated system, and then that integrated system is actually interfaced into the PDMPs themselves, and then they can go through and get what they would get normally from the other side. If you notice from the PDMP down, um, they're the exact same process. It's just the at the front end on how the individual user is accessing the information. Next slide. Um, as you see here, the key points I want to make here. Oh, can you go back? You see these two red circles here. The, the points that I want to make here, that these are the huge differences, and these are the important players. If you look in the, the upper right-hand corner, that red circle there, that's the integrated system. And then you have the PDMP. Those are the major players. It doesn't really come down to us at the federal level, but it's about the service providers and their systems working with the PDMP. And as I mentioned, there are 54 of them out there, so there's a lot of hurdles that may, that may have to be, be jumped on this. Next slide now. So if I had to look at it in a very simple big picture, if you look to the far left, these are whatever um, services are out there and their integrated software system. And on the far right, these are the PDMPs. But the interesting part, the, the key part is that information sharing hub in the center. That's the one that they can work with to integrate what they're doing on the left with what the PDMPs have available on the right. And when you have to put those three in, in place, it's extremely important to know that there are methods out there that we have worked with PDMP already and systems um, technology that's already available out there. It doesn't come down to what. We've done what we've done. And, and if I could put it into perspective, think that we have created an option and what the service providers need to do is create that plug to put into the system. Next slide, please. I mentioned about uh, what we have a, that we have a methodology in place, and that's called the RX Check Hub. And we actually divide, uh, uh, divide that uh, so people that want to integrate with systems and go get information not only within a state but also uh, outside states, that this was there. It's, uh, it's uh, of no cost. It's made it's available through the government. And I'll tell you some of the, the benefits to it. But there are other information sharing hubs. This is the one specifically that the U.S. Department of Justice makes available to the field. Next slide, please. Now, these are just uh, this just gives you kind of an overview of what we're looking for, what we're looking at. These are things that we don't use in proprietary software, and all the things that are extremely important. These are the elements that your provider needs to be aware of. That when they're attempting to make that. Uh, and I like people that, that use one-click access point to get this information. These are the elements that are extremely important. And I will say, you know, the two bottom bullet points, one, it's end-to-end -end security, which is extremely important. And second of all, it's of no cost to integrated users. It, it's that of the service providers. Next slide. So this is just the one, the, this is the key point that I wanted to make, that it, this is a communication tool. What we're using is that center hub. It's not a database. We're not collecting data. We're not hosting data. We're not doing any of those things. So we want to know, let you know that it's open source, that it's, um, that's free and open to, to all. It's economical, secure, and maintains local control. Three key points in sharing information from the federal government. And finally, that it allows um, to use what tools that your integrated system already feels comfortable with. We're not asking you to change the way you do business. With that, I'll turn it back over to our host. Thank you so much for that presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion where we can talk a little bit more. I love the one-click 
analogy that you made. That is so important for our providers and love to explore that a little bit more. But at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Chalmers to make her presentation. Thank you, Rebecca, and uh, welcome to our federal partners. Uh, next slide, please. Let me start by highlighting that every day CMS ensures that uh, close to 160 million people have health coverage. Uh, and these are across our programs, about 88.4 in Medicaid, 66.4 in Medicare, and about 16.4 million consumers access healthcare through the marketplace. Next slide, please. Our vision is that we serve the, the public as a trusted partner and steward dedicating to advancing health equity, expanding coverage, and improving health outcomes. And you see here our six strategic pillars uh, that are the primary focus of our work. How we advance equity, how do we expand access, engaging with partners, this is why we're here today, driving innovation, protecting our programs, and fostering excellence. CMS could be a great, great place to work. Next slide, please. Related to oral health, uh, last year, CMS launched the CMS Oral Health Cross-Capping Initiatives, where we will consider opportunities to expand access to oral health coverage using our existing authorities and health plan flexibilities. You can see here that that's one of the cross-capping initiatives in addition to rural health, behavioral health, maternity care. And these programs are multi-year, the cross-component initiatives uh, where we align and advance the work. Uh, next slide, please. But when it comes to interoperability and the oral health provider, it's really important to consider the landscape today. On the left, you see a, dent a representation of a dental office with the returning patients and those that only come when there is an emergency. But the dental delivery system remains siloed from the rest of healthcare. And when people don't have access to the dental delivery system, they often will end up either in the emergency department or with complications and that require admission. I've asked, added here ambulatory surgical centers is another critical point in access to care, especially for the children and adults with special health care needs, urgent clinics. And then, of course, you see also the schools and the arenas because they can also serve as a point of uh, or receiving uh, dental services. Now, let's focus on that barrier that exists between the dental delivery system and the rest of healthcare, and that is that health information technology device, the lack of broad use of diagnostic coders in dentistry that make the integration and coordination of care very challenging. For example, you can be in an emergency department, and if you present there with any other problem, the physician can just you know, click on a menu and uh, to use the analogy of one click, they could make a one click referral. That currently is uh, close to impossible to make a one click referral to a dental provider to address the needs of the patient. Next slide, please. And of course, in a given year, many people see both a medical and a dental provider. In the US, that's about 121 million people. But we should recognize that while they have had access to both providers, that doesn't mean that there was any meaningful exchange of information between these two providers because they're often on very different systems. The other piece that's important here is to recognize that, you know, 112 million people only see a medical provider. And that, again, presents a challenge uh, when they don't have access to the oral health records and system. And for those 28 million that only see a dental provider, again, provides an opportunity to talk about the in systemic impact of poor oral health, uh, but dentists often lack uh, the integrated uh, health record to understand the medical conditions for these patients, and they rely on what patients report. Uh, next slide, please. When we initially looked at this, you know, of course, if how many people see a medical and dental provider, it became very obvious that this trend is true for those with private medical and dental insurance but also holds true for those with private medical without dental and public only. What you notice though, that coverage is really important. And for uh, patients with private medical and dental, they have the highest rates of both seeing a medical and a dental provider. And again, just to underscore, that doesn't mean that their systems necessarily are connected or that they have access to the same patient information. And the next slide. 
I'm going to review the changes in the 2024 physician fee schedule and talk about the impact on the need to exchange information between a medical and a dental provider. But let's start by with the next slide focusing on the statutory exclusion in Section 1864 of the Social Security Act where no payment should be made with the connect anything related to connection with the care, treatment, filling, removal, and replacement of teeth, with a very small exception, uh, where the underlying medical condition uh, is impacted. Based on this, in the 2023 physician fee schedule, the next slide, we clarified and codified, next slide please, thank you, uh, all aspects of the previous payment under the Medicare fee-for-service policy for dental services. We also uh, uh, finalized the payment for dental services uh, that are inextricably linked to other covered medical services, such as dental exam and treatment prior to organ transplant, cardiac valve replacement, and vulval plasty. And we said that those can be performed inpatient and outpatient. Again, highlighting the need for interoperability within the hospital system, but also outside. Um, a process, we established a process where we would consider through public submission, uh, potentially analogous clinical scenarios under which Medicare payment can be made for these dental services. And we said in the 2024 rule, we will consider payment for head and neck cancer. Next slide, please. You will see that in the 2024 rule, we clarified that when we say head and neck cancer, that refers both to primary and metastatic. We also made clarification that for head and neck cancer, that is treatment that's delivered prior to contemporary with or after the radiation or chemotherapy. And then we added the chemotherapy services for the treatment of cancer, so dental services that are inextricably linked to the chemotherapy services, scar T, cell therapy, and high dose bone uh, modifying agents. We work with our partners in the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and I'm just gonna highlight two reports that were very integral to advancing these policies. On the next slide, you will see the summary uh, and the review of the uh, efficacy of dental services for reducing adverse events in those receiving chemotherapy for cancer, uh, and also the efficacy of dental services for reducing adverse events in those undergoing insertion of implantable cardiovascular devices. The evidence there wasn't sufficient for us to finalize in the rule, but the partnership and the exchange of information was critical with our partners at ARC. Next slide. And in addition to this, Medicare now recognizes all specialties for enrollment. Next slide, please. Ah, I think we're up to the questions. So one uh, thing I would like to add is that uh, it is very clear in the final rule that it is important to, uh, to have that exchange of information between the dental and medical provider in order for these services first to be considered inextricably linked and uh, payment to be made under the Medicare rule. We'll address this uh, further, uh, but thank you for the opportunity to make these comments. Thank you so much for your comments. You know, I wanna take a, a little bit of privilege here and just say, of we talked, you, your programs have a, a lot to offer and, and service some, some of the folks that you service have the, are the sickest of the six or are being seen in, um, you know, EDs and things like that. <laughs> and right now the burden of managing electronic records between medical and dental is on the patient. And I'm, I hope everyone is considering how we can take that burden off of the, the patient, off of the providers and use the tools, the technology that's already existing to move us forward. I'm hoping that we can talk a lot about that a little bit more in the moderated discussion, but at this time, I want to um, invite uh, Dr. Taylor to speak. As, as Rebecca said, uh, my name is Al Taylor, medical informatics officer um, at ONC. I'm also the technical lead for uh, an ONC program called USCDI, which I think a lot of folks are familiar with. Uh, and uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of different things today. I'm going to talk about interoperability in general. Uh, I'm going to talk about information blocking, which was an area of great interest uh, in preparation for this uh, for this panel discussion. Uh, the ONC Health IT Certification Program um, and the Certified Health IT it Certifies. Uh, and then a component of the certification program um, and near and dear to my heart is the USCDI, uh, the USCDI data set. 
Um, interoperability was defined in the 21st Century Cures Act way back in 2016, um, but it has a couple of key points. Um, it, the uh, interoperability, health IT interoperability is defined as technology that enables a secure exchange and use of electronic health information. That is really the bottom line. Um, so secure exchange um, um, by using uh, a secure exchange between um, healthcare entities, providers, um, including access by patients um, to their health information. Uh, and also the use part is really important because um, exchanging uh, data or information or electrons um, is not the same as being able to use, read, process, digest, integrate um, the information that's being shared. Um, and uh, the, the information that is being exchanged needs to be, or is in the case of interoperable health IT, um, is, uh, is consumable by um, the receiving uh, uh, technology system. Um, and another key part of this is uh, the without special effort. So does not require a master's degree in computer science. Um, it uses um, standardized uh, standardized functions for, uh, depending on the user type that's accessing the information, um, to be able to do it um, uh, seamlessly. Uh, and it allows, the technology will also allow for complete access and exchange um, of the information, um, again, for authorized user. And I saw a question in the uh, I, I saw one of the questions um, about, uh, I think it's related to this, um, access to information is controlled just like all health information has controlled access uh, and there's electronic access control um, for authorized users, whether that's a patient who's authorized to view their own information or a provider who's authorized to use uh, anybody else's information. And the technology, um, uh, the technology also uh, cannot, uh, prohibit, inhibit, discourage the exchange of information, which is what we um, term as information blocking. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, the uh, So these are the things that we just basically talked about that. These are the things that uh, uh, interoperable health IT provides. Really, bottom line, access to electronic health information. Um, and um, it's used by patients to access their record. Um, the um, it's used by providers, obviously, for ref um, during referrals, they can they can uh, uh, receive information from uh, the referring uh, provider or the referring uh, health network um, and use that information in their systems uh, to continue care. Uh, it can be used for public health reporting, quality improvement programs, and reporting, uh, population health, patient safety, care coordination, a lot of different things that can be um, that EHI can be used for. Uh, and then also provides access to payers as a um, um, using the the you know the HIPAA payment um, process, um, the treatment um, um, treatment operations um, and payment. The uh, those that's the payment part of it. Also um, has access to electronic health information um, for all the reasons why payers need to access that um, information. Information blocking is sort of the uh, is the interference with electronic health information exchange. Um, the information blocking rule uh, was also was part of the um, um, the ONC certification uh, final uh, ONC Cures Act final rule. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but it defines information blocking as um, practices that are likely to interfere with the access exchange or use of electronic health information. Um, it's uh, a practice that is uh, done or made by certain actors, including uh, providers, um, health information exchanges, and developers of certified health IT. And that's a distinction um, with, um, with developers of non-certified health IT um, are not considered actors under the information rule, um, uh, but providers who use uncertified health IT um, can be considered actors um, that, that that whose practices could inhibit um, access exchange or use of health IT and constitute information blocking. Um, those practices, information blocking also includes um, or, or excludes practices um, that are required by law. So privacy protection, et cetera. Um, um, those are, that is a practice that's required by law, um, which would block uh, information exchange rightfully so. 
Uh, and then there's a number of different exceptions. I'm going to uh, I'm not going to talk about the specific permissible and uh, per, uh, permissible exceptions, but I'll, I'm, I'm going to point to some resources that will help with that. Um, so those are the things that constitute information blocking. Um, and um, one of the one of the key points about this um, is that the uh, situations in which information blocking is suspected um, will be investigated by um, the officer of the inspector general at HHS, and it is handled on a case by case basis. So it's really not possible to say in a particular hypothetical scenario whether or not something um, does or would consider um, would be considered information blocking. Um, and that one other thing about the information blocking is not only does these practices have to be occurring. Um, but they have to, the actor has to have knowledge um, of the practice being likely to interfere. So if the actor does not know um, or doesn't necessarily, uh, would not be necessarily expected to know that the practice would do so, um, that may exclude uh, uh, an implication of information blocking. Uh, we have a, a, a number, since this is one of our, part of our regulations, uh, the uh, we have a lot of resources. Um, draw your attention uh, in particular to um, our frequently asked questions, which are all um, included on the um, healthit.gov um, um, slash information blocking uh, website. There are a bunch of resources that will help ask um, answer questions. Um, and in situations where uh, information blocking is suspected, we have a reporting portal um, where you can go and either anonymously anonymously or non-anonymously report uh, report information blocking, uh, suspected information blocking, and, and ONC will will take it from there. Um, the uh, uh, We also, if you would like to hear more about information blocking, um, our uh, policy shop um, is more than happy to provide additional information. And we have a um, our our, root, our uh, health IT speaker request form that that a lot of people exercise in order to um, get more information on uh, information blocking or any other aspect of um, um, things that ONC does. Um, I'm going to just touch briefly on the information the the certification program. One of the one of ONC's primary roles is to administer the the certification program. It's a voluntary program which which validates that. Uh, that technology um, supports interoperability um, and uh, by um, by performing um, specific standardized functional um, and uh, functional and content requirements. Um, it was um, it was defined as early as the two thousand in 2012 and we've gone through multiple um, editions. Uh, the most recent current edition is the Cures Act final rule, um, which in addition to ad um, advancing the certification edition, uh, and some of the certification functionality um, specifically focused on interoperability um, by updating some certification requirements, including the um, development or refinement of application programming interfaces, interfaces APIs, um, to allow for easy access, easy authorized access to um, information. Um, and the Cures Act final rule, as I said, also established the information blocking rule. We recently published um, in in January of this year, we published um, um, our latest um, uh, certification edition called HTI-1, um, which will, is required uh, conformance with that for certified health IT is required um, as of January 1st of 2026. And it again, updates the certification program and information blocking uh, rules. Um, the uh, one aspect of so I mentioned that in the cert the certification program um, um, manages uh, functionality um, of health IT. Uh, one aspect of functionality is the content, um, the standardized content that everybody could expect to see with information exchange. Um, and that um, that defined core data set is called the US Core Data for Interoperability. And that's the program that I um, that I manage. Um, it's a core set of data that we'd expect for a broad array of users to uh, to uh, need to use or access. Um, it has standardized content, the use of uh, health IT standards, uh, terminology standards, um, and it's not. But it's not just used for certified health IT. It can be used for other programs, 
um, the uh, CMS uh, patient and provider access or sort of payer and provider access um, rules um, also reference USCDI, um, although it's not necessarily um, part of, it does not necessarily uh, require the use of uh, certified health IT. It uses the the the, the uh, data that's in USCDI. And we have an annual process where we expand it based on a lot of public input. Um, and over the last five years, we have um, we've published um, USCDI um, um, with a with an annual version. Um, the first one was the first introduction. Um, it uh, it included um, some key additional information uh, from what's considered to be a, what we call the common clinical data set. Um, it expanded the uh, the in certain areas, including um, including these noted here with clinical notes of pediatric vital signs. Um, we introduced, we, this is the first, the version two is the first version that introduced the equ equity data, um, equity-based data, or that supports equitable um, healthcare, um, particularly focusing on SOGI and social determinants of health. Um, version three um, added some additional um, elements related to equity and disparities um, and further supporting public health reporting. This is the version of USCDI that is required in HTI-1, the, the rule that we recently published uh, and I just mentioned, uh, and and so everybody everybody with certified health IT in order to remain certified will have to um, update to USCI version three by by January of 2026. Um, version four continued um, uh, continued with a, a, um, additional uh, additional data around health status assessment um, and some uh, medication uh, uh, medication reconciliation data, uh, and then finally version five continue to make updates um, advanced into areas of um, advanced directives um, and a number of um, um, sex and gender related data um, to further support uh, health equity. Um, we also, um, at the request of ADA, um, we also uh, changed the way that we reference um, CDT um, because just to highlight the fact that CDT is not only for dental EHRs, there are a few certified dental EHRs, um, but CDT is useful for um, representing dental uh, dental procedures of, of whether it's dental procedures in a dental EHR or dental procedures in a medical EHR. Uh, and so we reference that. Additional um, additional dental data standards um, are certainly candidates for consideration for adding to uh, to both to USCDI and some of the other certification criteria. Um, and that's handled um, through the, the, the regular update process that I described. And, uh, and we are currently, we published draft V5, which made some of these changes that I mentioned. Um, uh, and um, we have, uh, there's actually, we're in a comment period right now where we're considering uh, additional data elements um, for USCDI and um, and also um, um, any kind of comments on the changes that we made um, um, to the additional data elements that we added to USCDI. So I'm gonna stop there. We're time for questions. Um, happy to answer questions um, or uh, refer you to people that can answer the questions better than me. <clears throat> and uh, if you have any information, you can contact me. Um, contact um, ONC through the uh, uh, the information blocking uh, uh, portals that I've, I've provided, as well as um, the ON, the main ONC website. I'm gonna so I'm gonna stop there, and I guess it's we've got. I'll, I'll turn it back to Rebe uh, turn it back to Rebecca. Sorry, I'll let you handle that. Thank you so much, um, Al, for your your presentation, and I'm just gonna editorialize again um, and say. What a tremendous pleasure it has been working with the ONC on um, work, working on getting dental uh, procedures uh, represented using the CDT. Um, it's been a, a great joy. I encourage all of the folks on the on the line to submit comments to draft five. What um, what else from dental may need to be represented in in core data sets? Um, and certainly, if you if you're happy with the editorial change on the way that CDT is listed, please express that um, that uh, opinion as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite uh, Peyton Isaac to make the final presentation before we go into discussion. Wonderful. Thanks so much again for having me.
Um, for those who aren't familiar with my office, the HHS Office for Civil Rights, we, among other things, are responsible for enforcing the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, many of you know it as HIPAA. Now, in regulation, HIPAA consists of rules, so privacy, security, and breach notification rules. So I wanted to open today by providing an overview of the HIPAA rules and discuss briefly how they apply to protect health information, including dental information, and how they apply to dental practices. Now, generally, the HIPAA rules protect the privacy and security of certain health information when held by certain persons. Um, those persons are defined in law as covered entities and business associates. Now, covered entities are health plans, health uh, care clearinghouses, and healthcare providers that conduct standard electronic transactions. Uh, not all healthcare providers are covered entities, but generally, if the provider bills insurance for the services that they provide, they are considered a covered entity. Now, covered entities are not limited to those healthcare providers that bill Medicare or other federal health benefits programs, uh, such as VA. So dentists are not, nor have they ever been categorically exempt or excluded from complying with the HIPAA rules. A business associate, on the other hand, is a person or entity that works for or on behalf of the covered entity, and their work must involve the use or disclosure of protected health information. So for instance, if you are a practice and you employ uh, an electronic health record vendor to supply your, um, your medical record, that vendor is likely your business associate and would need to operate pursuant to a valid business associate agreement. Now, what is uh, protected health information, or we refer to it as PHI? PHI consists of individually identifiable health information transmitted or maintained by or on behalf of the covered entity. So, for example, um, demographic information may be included uh, any information collected on behalf of a, or collected about a new patient, any information about the individual's health status or their health history. All right, so let's take a look at what the HIPAA rules actually are. Uh, the first rule you're likely very familiar with, it's known as the HIPAA privacy rule. Generally, under this rule, covered entities and their business associates are prohibited from using or disclosing PHI unless the use or disclosure is expressly required or permitted by the privacy rule. So for example, written authorization by the individual, uh, HIPAA uh, expressly permits a covered healthcare provider to disclose an individual's health information using written authorization of the patient. Now the privacy rule also explicitly permits certain types of use and disclosures. So for example, the privacy per, uh, rule permits a covered entity to disclose an individual's protected health information for the treatment activities of the healthcare provider. This means that the covered healthcare provider is permitted to disclose an individual's PHI to another healthcare provider, whether or not that healthcare provider is a covered entity, if again, for treatment purposes. Now, the privacy rule also explicitly permits uses and disclosures without an individual's authorization for certain national priorities. Um, among those permissions include for certain public health activities and health oversight activities. Um, under the health oversight activities permission, a covered entity is permitted to disclose PHI to a health oversight agency. One example that you heard at the top of this program is to uh, PDMP programs. The permission includes a non-exhaustive list of activities that are considered oversight. So, uh, you know, to an insurance commissioner would be another example. Now, the privacy rule also confers certain rights on individuals who are the subject of the PHI. Specifically, the privacy rule affords individuals with the right to access and inspect their own medical record if that record is contained in the covered entity's designated record set. Now, the designated record set is just the set of records used by the covered entity to make decisions about the individual, and it's construed rather uh, broadly. Uh, covered entities are required to disclose PHI to individuals if that individual requests access. Now, under this right, the covered entity is uh, generally required to provide the individual 
with access within 30 days of the receipt of the request. And the right also includes the right to direct the covered entity to transmit to a third party an electronic copy of the individual's protected health information that is maintained in their EHR. Now, I wanted to focus specifically on the right of access because um, we've announced more than 40 settlements in the past several years with covered entities for their failure to comply with the right of access. And these complaints come to OCR in the form of complaints from individuals that they've entered on our website. Now, when we receive a complaint, um, it, it's you know always the com complaint is that the covered entity is not complying with the right of access. Our first step is to offer technical assistance to the covered entity. If we determine that uh, technical assistance is not sufficient to resolve the issue, maybe the covered entity uh, does not agree to uh, comply or perhaps is unresponsive, then we will need to take a more serious enforcement action. Now, I reviewed our enforcement data from um, several years back and identified a total of six enforcement actions against dental practices. Of the six, three were most recently settled in September of 2022. And in all three of these cases, it involved the uh, failure to comply with an individual's request to access their information. And so uh, copies of these resolution agreements, if you'd like to view them, are publicly available on our website. You would just navigate to the HIPAA tab for professionals and go under compliance and enforcement. And you can view all of the, um, not only the right of access cases, but all of our compliance cases for the past several years. Now, one topic that arises frequently in the context of interoperability and data exchange is about how HIPAA intersects with information blocker, blocking. And Dr. Taylor has um, described information blocking. I'll just say that we did work closely with ONC to ensure that the HIPAA rules do align with information blocking to the extent possible. Um, so for example, one of the information blocking exceptions allows an actor to deny an individual's request for access if it is consistent with the privacy rules allowance for denial of access, such as um, if the information requested is psychotherapy notes. Psychotherapy notes are um, an exception to the right of access. All right, I also want to mention the HIPAA security rule. The security rule applies only to PHI that is in electronic format. And it requires that covered entities and their business associates employ appropriate administrative, physical, and technical safeguards to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and security of electronic PHI. Now, the security rule is designed to be flexible, scalable, and it is technology agnostic. And this is important. Um, this means that in many cases, the security rule allows a covered entity to determine how to comply with the requirements, in other words, how to protect their data within certain parameters. Um, the security rule was issued in 2003. And uh, since that time, the healthcare system's connectedness has increased tremendously. So it has become um, very important for entities to comply with the security rule. I'll also say that we've announced that we are working on proposed modifications to the HIPAA security rule to strengthen the cybersecurity of ePHI. Now stay tuned for more on that proposed rule. One trend we are seeing is that since 2021, we've seen more than 700 breaches of PHI affecting over 500 individuals. We are on track for the second year in a row um, to, to demonstrate that hacking is responsible for approximately 80% of large breaches. And so the cybersecurity implications are certainly growing. Now, the third HIPAA rule I'd like to highlight is the breach notification rule. It requires covered entities to provide notification to affected individuals, the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, and in some cases, the media, if the breach is large enough, following a breach. And it also requires a covered entity's business associate that experiences a breach to notify the covered entity that that business, experience, um, that that business associate has 
uh, suffered a loss of data or a breach of data. Okay, with that, I'll turn it back to the moderator and other panelists, and I'm prepared to take questions. Thanks. Thank you so much. And um, I will share that uh, the ADA does have many resources on uh, cybersecurity, HIPAA. Um, so please um, send an email to our, to our email that will be displayed on the slide or message any of us that you may know on the team. And we'll happy to direct you to those as well as the, the resources from uh, the OCR. Uh, really appreciate everyone's comments. Um, and thoughts and the ability that you guys have to share all of the amazing work that your agencies are undertaking. Um, I do wanna open this up to a, a discussion on some of the topics that we've heard today. Um, so I'm gonna kick off by directing a question to Dr. Taylor, but this is for everyone. So please uh, jump in and have a discussion um, if you'd like. Um, what role do digital health electronic dental records and other software vendors have in ensuring that EHI is accessible to those who need it at the time that they need it? Um, Rebecca, you basically just defined interoperability for everybody uh, or redefined it. Um, the electronic, so uh, electronic um, record systems, um, we know at least store, collect, capture, store health data. Um, they, whether they uh, certified health IT, health IT data on the ONC in the ONC certifi certification program um, requires that it, in some cases, capture uh, and uh, enables access um, uh, to data using specific standards, functional, structural, exchange and exchange standards. Um, uncertified health IT may or may not um, do that in the same way. Um, but that's that's the but the creation um, and curate uh, and storage and access to that information is pretty standard across all health IT. Um, um, the as far as the exchange goes, um, one of the, the benefits of a of a certified health IT product is it's it's um it's been validated, it's been tested, it's been certified that it does things in a certain way. So that sets the expectation that you can receive data in a certain way um, and the expectation that you send data in a certain way. Um, and that includes the use of these ease of access functions like st structured documents, um, like the consolidated clinical data uh, uh, document architecture, transitions of care document, discharge summaries and the like that um, that are uh, standardized across the industry, the entire industry, the entire healthcare industry, um, and and also using the application programming interfaces, these little APIs, and and David referred to um, referred to the PDMP as the plug, and the APIs are plugs. They're standardized plugs that you can use. You can plug into one API and get, and you know that information coming out of that is going to be a certain kind of information. It could be medication. It could be uh, lab data, it could be diagnosis data, it could be encounter data, um, but you know what you're gonna get out of that, of that certified API. Uh, and that's one of the, um, and, and, and as long as you have, obviously everything requires authorized access, uh, but when you have authorized access, you know what you're gonna get. And so that's the, that's the big advantage of, of those, those APIs because if they're easy to set up, they're easy to, they may not be easy to establish, but once you have access to those, um, they're very easy to they're very easy to to use. I am just going to jump around for a minute here because you did bring up the topic of APIs, um, and we're actually starting to see some standardized uh, APIs being named in federal regulation, um, specifically some of the fire APIs that have been developed uh, for specific purposes like uh, prior auth. Um, these may be familiar to our audience, uh, unfamiliar to our audience. It's not something that is is prevalent in a lot of our software. Um, can I would like to open it up and just see if anybody has any thoughts on what your agency's roadmaps or strategies for promoting APIs may be, um, what barriers you may be um, identifying need to be addressed, what federal initiatives may be launched to support the adoption uh, and implementation of these APIs. I'll, I'll open just by clarifying that from um, a HIPAA perspective, remember the HIPAA rules 
and I said this at the top of my presentation, are generally technology neutral. And, you know, they we designed them that way intentionally. So uh, OCR does not endorse the use of specific technologies um, in order to comply with the, with the rules. Having said that, um, I guess we would say that we'd like uh, users to be aware that in many cases, health technologies that are not offered to the patient directly on behalf of the provider, uh, meaning they are not considered a business associate, you know, they're not protected by a business associate agreement, may be considered uh, a third party. And so for that reason, it's important to ensure that there's education and coordination with partners around um, how, how APIs work and how patient information will flow through them. Yeah, uh, Rebecca, and if I could add one uh, uh, one comment related to the uh, rule, most recent rule. So, um, in, uh, the most recent CMS interoperability and prior authorization rule uh, has implications for certain payers and providers participating in the MIPS or the PA program. And MIPS here stands for the Merit Based Incentive Payment System or the Promoting Interoperability Program, in case the audience is not familiar. Mm -hmm. And that rule underscores our authority here at CMS to enforce compliance among payers required to implement these APIs that we're talking about, right? So again, providers engage in these programs, the PI and the MIPS program, must attest to submitting at least one electronic uh, prior authorization request using these uh, a prior authorization API. And I think this is an important consideration for those MIPS eligible clinicians, including physicians, and this is broad here, that includes, you know, doctors of dental medicine or doctors of dental surgery, um, uh, that again, for these professionals who are part of these programs, um, I would refer them to our Centers for Clinical Standards and Quality, uh, for all the details that are impacting the programs and the requirements. Um, I just wanted to mention, I, I'm, I'm working on a question from Corey McGee. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish the question, but I wanted to answer it um, out loud as well. Um, the, the question was about um, marketing specific products to, um, according to um, Corey, um, that are marketed specifically as compliant with information blocking regulation. I'm not particularly aware of that practice. It's um, um, but they're like um, like Peyton mentioned, um, information blocking, I, I would it's it's maybe a little bit less technology specific, um, but um, um, then than HIPAA, um, but because it's involves the exchange of of electronic health information. So the technology has to be able to exchange electronic health information. Um, there's no specific um, uh, software, including certified health IT, that that prevents or even um, assists in um, avoiding information blocking. The information blocking can be a practice of a provider, uh, a technology vendor, um, or an information exchange. Those are the three primary categories of actors, um, and and so the practice is different than the technology used. Um, and there's, to my knowledge, there's, there's, there's no specific software um, that prevents, um, um, that prevents it. And if, and if it is a certified health IT vendor that has a practice that prevents it, that is a potential information blocking um, event uh, or scenario. But again, it's, um, it's to be determined. So, um, and, and uh, we, uh, I don't, I don't believe that, I mean, ONC does not, um, general marketing of um, uh, we're not really we not really uh, uh, monitor marketing um, practices of software vendors, um, but uh, um, but it, there's no there's no specific software that that does that for a provider. And let me just this is David Lewis from BJ. I just wanted to add just briefly is you know when you're when you're choosing your software provider. Or um, the one thing that um, that service provider, you, you really need to take a look at, uh, do they really do and have the connections that they say that they do? Um, only because a lot of them say that they can do this and that, but as you get into it, 
um, and start to use it, you find out that there are some issues. The biggest thing about choosing your provider is to know what you want first and that can, they, they can deliver that services and not actually create uh, silos of information. Thank you all for your, your thoughts on that. Um, uh, Dr. Chalmers, uh, I think you touched on it a little bit earlier in, in your earlier comments, but I, I, I do want to just approach this directly. Um, broadly speaking, dentistry has been carved out of many of the interoperability rules and the incentive programs uh, around interoperability. However, you mentioned a, a few policy changes that you have shared, um, and we may expect some additional regulations to apply. Um, how do you foresee federal mandates or incentives influencing the adoption uh, of interoperable systems in dental practices? Yeah, thank you for this question. And again, you're absolutely right. While dental practices have historically been more peripheral to these interoperability initiatives, the landscape is evolving. Uh, one key area of focus, I think, is the adoption of FIRE. And again, for the audience who may not be familiar, this is the Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources Standards. Uh, in particularly when it comes to uh, processes like FIRE authorization, uh, this move indicates a broader trend towards integrating the dental health information into the wider healthcare ecosystem. Again, aiming to streamline uh, processes and enhance patient care. I love one of the questions about like, what's the bottom line here? And if I could just take a quick stab at that, you know, better interoperability for the patient, for the patient means uh, better outcomes, better ease of accessing the information. For the providers means they can actually talk to each other. This is somewhat simplifying it, but really the impact is across the healthcare system. And obviously from a program perspective, I already talked about the impact of uh, interoperability on these programs like uh, MIPS and uh, uh, promoting interoperability. But let me just also add that, again, in addition to these developments, even in the direct absence of these requirements, there is an emerging recognition that we need this exchange of information to ensure better coordination of care. And as I highlighted in the policy changes, although they're very small in the Medicare space, right? That is a absolute must that the providers need to exchange information so they could deliver the care that the patients need uh, and it's payable under the physician fee schedule. Like this is really important uh, step of that process. Uh, I, would, I would also add that this uh, evolving technology and clear patient benefits, I think should encourage dental practices to think about adopting interoperable systems. I am sure, you know, we had about 100 people here. Some of them have worked in a system that has good interoperability, where they, as providers, have access to the full record, including, you know, all the medications, all the labs. I mean, that provides a different level of care when the patient's sitting in your chair and you have all the information you need to deliver that. Um, and then I would just say, this is to me, you know, the focus and thinking about patient-centered care, whole patient care. Wanted to share one other example. Uh, we engaged for, uh, in the spring of 2022, we conducted uh, an oral health human-centered design, customer engagement, where we asked our beneficiaries and, and providers and stakeholders, what are the barriers to accessing oral health care? I mean, it really gets to that part of it. Uh, specifically in Medicaid, but also the dose, those that are eligible both for Medicaid and Medicare, children and adults. And we interviewed close to 100 uh, people in this engagement and co-created a document that's called, you know, uh, Barriers to Oral Health Care. I'll put the link in the chat or the questions and answers section. But one thing that I think is very relevant to our discussion is one of the barriers that emerged is the standardized patient records and the ability of the dental provider to communicate with the medical provider in order to provide the best care for their patients. So, I mean, I think regardless of the space and the program, providers are recognizing that that's preventing them from having the full information, delivering the best care, 
And as I highlighted in my opening remarks, that example with the emergency department, I think going you know, towards the mental delivery system, physicians are not able to easily refer patients even when they're able to identify a problem. And I think that gets to the overall cost of care that one can encounter when you receive care in the wrong place in the wrong uh, time. Uh, and I think that just really style, I mean, dentistry is an outlier, right? Any other specialty can receive that referral. Uh, we cannot, again, except what I would say with a few exceptions and some systems that have been able to really recognize the value of this integration uh, and how that impacts outcomes, et cetera. So I think the direction is clear uh, in the, our industry. And uh, I think the payers and the health IT vendors really need to think about how increasing this interoperability uh, helps, again, providers deliver the best care, uh, patients receive the best outcome, and the coordination of care. Because these are the same patients that show up in the dental office, in the clinic, right? And sometimes that is the biggest barrier, is not sharing the information and understanding where the needs are. Um, I wanted to answer a question that Jennifer Thompson asked um, in the Q&A um, about, um, uh, I'm sorry, actually it was a question um, from Kyle Pelkey. I did answer Jennifer's question. Wait, yeah, I did answered one of the questions about certified health IT. But the question is about um, um, data sets, um, defined or standardized data sets beyond um, uh, what's in USCDI. Um, I didn't mention it um, when I talked about um, when I talked about USCDI, but ONC has recently stood up um, a program called USCDI Plus, which defines uh, which defines. Uh, um, I describe them as program specific, but they could be uh, uh, use case specific um, data sets that are that are specifically needed uh, when the community can agree on a data set that is required, um, and it can can include standards that are required. Um, vocabulary standards, but also um, certain exchange standards, um, which is beyond the scope of USCDI, but within the scope of certification. Um, those those sorts of um, adopted um, standardized content um, and functions um, can be defined um, within a, a program we call USCDI Plus. So um, USCDI Plus Dental is a hypothetical uh, domain of USCDI Plus. Um, and we have engaged in, I think we're up to about seven different domains so far, um, if of Rio CDI Plus and looking to looking for uh, partners um, that will help us um, develop additional ones, again, defined by the by the users that would need it. Um, and uh, we do have not yet stood up a, a dental a dental domain in USCDI Plus, but certainly um, it's something that we would be we entertaining. And if you know, and if the firm, as 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 Kyle mentioned, um, is interested in doing that. Um, we're, we're definitely willing to work with the firm um, um, and other other parties, ADA uh, and the like, to define what those requirements would be um, and what those standards would be. And the benefit to having a, a USCDI plus dental program or a data set or a functional set is that that can be used as a smaller set of functions that, um, that um, programs, dentists, networks can, can adopt um, or in some cases might be required by another program um, that's that's easier to, it may be easier to digest. And so it's just a defined program and certified uh, health IT could say, oh, we can't really certify, but we can at least use the USCDI plus dental content um, in our, in our, um, in our systems. That's a, that's a, that's a possibility. Um, I'm certainly open to it. I think that is a, a wonderful statement and, and actually transitions me really well into this next question. Um, really, I want uh, everybody to, to answer this, but I'm going to ask Mr. Lewis to start. You had identified, you know, the, the one click options. Um, and I think every provider that is out there prescribing any type of controlled substance or anything like that is doing the best they can to do so safely and appropriate um, and are trying to address prescription misuse, fraud, um, but need the tools and technology to assist them in that process. 
So what would you offer to a provider who is looking um, to have their software avail vendors make that a possibility? How do they get involved? How do they ask for tools like what you have presented? Uh, the, well, the, the tools are already available out there. Um, it, like I said, the integration hubs that are out there, the standards that are out there, they're in the National Information Exchange model. Uh, what uh, elements are uh, relations to prescription drug monitoring program? Uh, those items, those are um, identified out there. And that's probably the one thing that I would say is, you know, that um, the dental software has, you know, people talk about what elements should be in there. Well, the dental profession has certain things that are unique to them. The medical profession has certain things that are unique to them. Cosmetology might have something that's used. I mean, so each profession has something that are unique, but the prescript, the, the drugs and the uh, medications and all that are universal. So there aren't ones. So, so if they identify which ones that are, um, that they're most interested in, but then when they look at the national um, uh, architecture, you know, the, the NEEM, the national exchange information exchange model, and then look at, when they're going to build their software, uh, that's you know, they can build those items in items in there. But what I would say to a service provider, more than anything else, is it's important to um, to know that in the prescription drug prescription drug monitoring program that the state plays a key point. They can have all the bells and whistles in their um, in their product but they have to get approval from the state to be part of that. And you'll have service providers that may have three or four or five states that, and they may work great among themselves, but as they cross lines and go and work with other service providers or other states, it might not work as well. Let's say, for example, there were a service provider has 15 states, but to get that agreement, they have to get that with each one of the states. So there's not, there's not a, um, a magic button, let's say, that they can just say, we have this and we want to we want to make it available. There has to be a relationship between the service provider, the state PDMP, and like I said, um, the Bureau of Justice Assistance as part of the PDMP program provides one of the informational hubs that can help link the data once they get the approvals, once you're crossing state lines. All right, and we are we are running quick uh, uh, out of time, and so I have a couple of more um, questions I want to get to, but I think there's an important one I'd like to address to um, Peyton Isaac. We we talked a lot about the the actors within the system who have responsibility for the exchange maintenance um, of information, and I think you touched on it a little bit during your presentation, but. Can you speak a little bit more about what role patients have in managing their health information and making sure that their rights are safeguarded? Um, you know, I think one of the things that is hard for patients and in providers to communicate is that when information is shared with third-party apps and things like that, those that that's outside of HIPAA. How do we how do we begin having that conversation? in a way that is, makes better informed consumers and, and, and users of the healthcare system. Right. Well, well, certainly, I mean, the most basic response is to have the conversation and, and individuals um, from a patient perspective, they do need to be informed about how their health information is protected, um, especially when they request that their information be sent outside of a HIPAA covered entity. Um, what does this look like? You know, in practice, uh, a patient may ask their healthcare provider or dental provider, I should say, to send their information to a third party app, maybe some sort of fitness app or monitoring app or whatever that is not owned or managed by the provider. Now, uh, you know, OCR does not say don't do that, uh, but we are saying to uh, be aware of whether or not that third party is managed directly by the provider. Um, because if not, know that the HIPAA rules, you know, do not apply to protect it. There's good news in that the FTC regulates many health apps that are not regulated by uh, HIPAA. 
and the FTC has a requirement. So for instance, if you publicize or advertise or say that your healthcare app has uh, particular protections and it does not, that's an enforceable action by the FTC. Uh, they also have breach notification requirements. Um, we also support the use of telehealth, but you know we, we caution individuals, not caution individuals, but we encourage individuals that again, if there are concerns, ensure that you have a talk with your provider about the confidentiality and security provisions of using telehealth. Um, and, and again, encourage questions. Certainly with the growth in cybersecurity incidents, uh, we suggest do things like avoid using public Wi-Fi to access your telehealth links or other maybe um, communication modalities with your provider. And um, know your HIPAA rights. I've talked in detail about the right to access your information, know how to exercise that right, be aware that providers have 30 days to respond to your request. Um, know that HIPAA has other rights that patients can exercise, such as the right to receive a notice of privacy practices. I always chuckle when I say that because I, as a patient, every time I go to uh, my doctor or dentist, I'm presented with a notice of privacy practices. But I, again, I say to, um, to patients, actually read them and understand uh, how your provider is using and disclosing your health information. And then finally, if a patient believes that their rights have been violated, their, specifically their privacy and security rights, know that you can you know, navigate to OCR's website and file a complaint. And that complaint will be followed up and investigated. Thank you so much. Um, we have a lot of questions on the table and I do want to address some of the the audience question. So I'm going to try to summarize a few of them that I've I've seen come across and that my my colleagues here uh, that you can't see have handed me. One of the things that I think has touched up on or we've touched on is there are certain requirements of certain programs, certain things that may not necessarily directly apply to dentistry, especially for those small private practice dentists who have one uh, one or two providers who don't have to use like say certified health information technology. Um, I think often there is a misconception that you don't need to worry about it or your vendors don't need to worry about it if they're not required to, right? So I, I wanted to get your guys' thoughts and your opinions on sort of what I'm gonna call um, optional compliance or optional participation may be better. How do we move the conversation from this is required, so you have to do it too. This is sort of the right thing to do. This is where the healthcare is going for information exchange and data exchange. How do we how do we inform the larger community around dental about how they can get involved, even if they're not required to? I'll take a quick pass at that one, a quick um, quick swing at that one. I think um, you know if the with with respect to search so the one of the advantages of uh purchasing and using implementing a certified health it product is that you know what you're getting um you know the capabilities um and you know that it should be you know with obviously some configuration should be i'm um, able to um uh, seamlessly um exchange health information and also but also store it in a standardized way um and so that's you know, that's, it kind of points towards, it, it's not just, it's not just altruism, like to do, like to do it for the sake of doing the right thing. Um, Cause the right thing is whatever makes your job easier, um, whatever makes your business better, um, whatever makes the patient healthier, um, you know, you know, any of those things are a potential incentives. Um, and, uh, but with certified health IT, you know what you're going to get. And so if you want to do seamless exchange, you can pick a certified IT product and do it. Um, you can also have, you can also uh, um, adopt um, software that does some of those functions, whether they've been certified or not. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that you can't use APIs. It doesn't mean that you can't create CCDA documents, send and receive them. It just means that you haven't gone through the certification program and the, the requirement, the technical requirements are, are out there published. 
um, by ONC, by um, our authorized certification bodies, um, by our authorized test labs. Um, those are um, that information is available to anybody who wants to um, adopt those standards again, with whether or not um, certification is pursued. Rebecca, and if I could add one uh, comment, this is, I mean, obviously spot on. Uh, one additional trend I am seeing is that people want to do it for both reasons, right? Because it's the right thing to do, but and when it's required. Uh, and one one example is that if they're not finding a solution in a particular product, they're moving to another one that can achieve these goals, right? Because providers are driven to deliver the best care. And if that's not possible, they have to find ways to coordinate the care, make that process more streamlined. So I hope that whoever is around the table where these issues are being discussed will put the patient in the center and say, like, do we provide a solution that improves the patient experience, the provider experience, and helps with the coordination of care? And to David's point, you know, the provider is actually being aware of what other prescriptions uh, patients is getting. Like, is, is it addressing these critical needs when it comes to delivering that whole person-centered care? And if the answer is no, then I think, again, we have some challenges ahead of us, but there are, there are opportunities to really think about uh, patients first and is the technology helping us get there? Thank you so much. And I first want to acknowledge everyone who has submitted questions that we have not gotten to. We had a, a ton submitted uh, on online before the event and during the event. Um, and I, I, I do also want to call out, we had a lot of questions about imaging and imaging uh, standards. Uh, the ADA takes that very seriously. So we are definitely going to follow up on making sure we get that information out and hopefully can have another panel with additional uh, agencies who may be able to address some of those comments. So uh, I do want to acknowledge that we we have know that we there's a lot more information that can be provided through these panelists and uh, future sessions. Um, at this time, I we have to kind of close up the, the session. And I just want to simplify the message here a little bit and say, I know what my key takeaways are. And that's really being, just as uh, Dr. Chalmers just said, patient-centered, right? So if the information is needed by the patient for care, for their own understanding of their health interactions with their health, um, we have to make sure that we're making that available. Um, mm -hmm. And so that is my my takeaway. But I'd like to ask you, what are your guys' key takeaways? And are there any actions that, that you would say, hey, as audience members, we have providers, vendors, um, state regulators. We have a, an entire group of, I want to say hello to the ADA standards group who are meeting in New Orleans. They're watching from a room and they're part of the, the people who are setting the informatics standards. So what would you say to this audience as, as your takeaways and your action items? I would just start uh, first. It will require uh, to continue the conversation and it's such an honor to work with our colleagues, federal colleagues across the board to advance these policies and achieve you know, that, uh, that goal of true interoperability between the dental providers and the rest of healthcare. So this is not, one and over, I think it requires continuous engagement with the right stakeholders um, and on the federal level, our partnership to move these policy forward. So very grateful for all of them and our work together. Thank you. I'll, I'll say that while I reviewed um, what HIPAA says you can and cannot do, the key takeaway is that HIPAA actually supports interoperability. It does contain key permissions to share information when needed for things such as treatment, payment, healthcare operations. We talked about public health um, and health oversight activities. And so that's key. And also HIPAA empowers patients uh, by giving them the right to access their own information. All right, um, again, I wanna say thank you to the panelists. Um, we are gonna go ahead and wrap up. I wanna thank everyone for coming. We really appreciate the interest in this important issue. It is a priority for the American Dental Association. 
Um, if you have any further questions um, about this session, about how you might be able to get involved with the ADA standards group who are working on the informatics side of things, how um, anything, anything that we can answer, um, please send that to the dental practice at ada.org email. Um, I hope all of you are willing to engage in the conversation and um, we'll find the, the roadmap for interoperability for dentistry. Um, I also will encourage you all to um, either take the survey immediately as it pops up after this session, or we'll be distributing it and other materials uh, after the session. And with that, thank you for your time. Thank you.